So next up, we're going to be hearing a bit about better multi-sig and co-signers for organizations using time locks. And our speaker is uh, Kevin Lowak. He's the CEO and co-founder at Wizard Sardine, known for products such as Liana and Revolt. So everybody, welcome Kevin. Right. Um, well, thank you for being here, everyone, and thank you for having me. Um, my talk is basically, well, not equal, but a little bit similar to the one uh, we just had before from Charles. So I'm going to build a little bit on that. Um, I'm going to be a little bit more explaining, really, what we can do today uh, without going too far into the technology and really the tools we have today. Uh, especially if you are an organization, um, if you hold some Bitcoin, uh, how you can actually improve that right away. Uh, the theme for this conference this year is level up. And so this is really how I built my talk um, from you know, the point you are probably starting to where you should probably be going and only with tools that are available today. So yeah, my name is Kevin Loeck. Um, I am the CEO at a company called Wizard Sardine. We're a Bitcoin security company. So what does that mean is that we help other organizations and uh, protocol developers uh, review their, um, their protocol or their work. Uh, so we do security audits. We break things uh, with responsible disclosure, of course. And also, we are known for our Liana wallet um, and our work on the Revolt uh, Bitcoin Vault architecture. So, as Charles was mentioning before, there is different needs for organization that are a little bit different from uh, the typical individual uh, holding Bitcoin. So one of them is obviously access. So you want people to be able to access the money and spend it when it's required, but you have an organization, so different people, right? Then on top of that, you need to have some kind of control, because if it's not just one person in control of everything, uh, you might want restrictions, you might want spending policies, um, and you basically yeah, want to know who will be like, necessary to authorize a payment, um, who will be regularly doing the payments, and that might not be the same person. So who is going to be an authorizer, if you want, and who is going to be creating the, the transactions? Another thing that's very important, uh, and that's also from the legal perspective, is the accountability. So who should be responsible if something fails? And this is one of the reasons why today still many organizations are using a trusted third party, so basically a custodian, instead of doing it themselves, because they just don't want the blame or they are too afraid of, if something go wrong, who should we blame? How is it going to work? Um, and yeah, this is pretty scary for organizations. So we are going to cover all of that. Uh, but my talk is still really very much about self-custody. Um, I'm not going to talk about uh, custodians in this talk. Um, so yeah, single signature, let's start with the beginning. Um, single signature is really not a good match for organizations. Um, especially if you don't have one person in control of everything and just doing all the spending and everything. So you might be surprised, but from my perspective, um, you know, having a Bitcoin security company, we talk to a lot of organizations. And way more often than I would like to, we hear organizations telling us that they are using a single SIG and they have multiple people who need to access the funds. And so to do that, they are just sharing the keys between people. Why? Because that fixed the problem we were talking about of access, right? You need different people to access the money at different time. Well, I can just share the, the private key, no? Why not using a, a single SIG? But the problem then is the control. You have no one that can enforce these payments. Anyone can just spend all the money. And accountability is just a no-go. So do not share keys. If you start sharing private keys, you will never know if something happens. You will never be able to prove who took the money because you know, any of the keys would be providing the same signature in this case. So what you should be doing at minimum is obviously using multi-signature. But I suppose if you are at this event, you probably are already at this stage. So now that we're going to talk about leveling up, it's pretty much from that point. So multi-signature, most people, uh, especially if you're not you know, hardcore Bitcoiners working on Bitcoin full time, um, you might have heard of multi-signature as like a one of two, uh, two of three, three of five, you know, one of the regular schemes. The general scheme is M of N, typically. So you have a certain amount of people or keys required to sign 
out of a number of available keys or people. And usually you have this threshold, meaning you have less keys required to sign than you have available. And the reason for that is that if you were losing a key otherwise, any single one of them, the funds would be locked forever. And so you kind of use this threshold to make sure that you, know, you can lose any single key and you still can access the funds, right? Now we can make that much, much, much better today. And so Charles was already mentioning that, um, something like a mandatory signer. So you can have a key that is mandatory to sign to authorize the payment to go out without removing the fact that there is a multi-sig here. So compared to like the slide before having maybe like a two of three, in a two of three, you don't have any single one of these keys that is mandatory. You, know, you need two of them, but that could be any two. Um, with a mandatory key, you can have one of these three keys that has to sign, and then it's a one of two of the others, for example. Um, that's really useful for implementing something called spending policies. So if you want to automate something like payment limits, you have a, a, sort of a, like a certain amount of Bitcoin, but maybe you don't want specific employees to be able to spend more than, I don't know, 10K per day or per transaction. Maybe you want to enforce a whitelist of addresses or payees um, that you cannot basically spend outside of. So nobody can just empty your wallet and send it to a random person as long as you have this uh, cosigner, so typically an HSM, that will be enforcing these rules. Another change in Bitcoin uh, that's been talked about a lot is covenants. So with covenants, you don't even need to have a specific key for that, which is great, but uh, we don't know when that will be merged in Bitcoin. So the covenants will let you basically enforce these rules directly at the wallet level. Uh, but yeah, that could take years, uh, multiple years, before it's implemented into Bitcoin. So as I was saying, we're talking about the things we can do today. So HSM you can do today. Um, and another thing that, you know, much more advanced, much more hardcore, uh, something we developed, which is called Revolt. Revolt is a Bitcoin vault architecture where you can also enforce all of these policies. But basically, the action is a little bit different. It's going to be letting your employees spend the coins but if they are spending outside of policy, the funds will move back to your wallet. And you can also have like a panic button where if you see any transaction that's just not normal, you can press it and it will just revoke the transaction. So you can also do that today, but it's much more complex. So if you're not a huge organization, uh, just forget about the, the revolt scheme right now. So what I was talking about really to show it as an example um, of the mandatory key here is that you could imagine having employees, let's say your operation teams, uh, two people, one of them needs to create a transaction, and then your CFO needs to approve it and to co-sign it, right? So in this case, this is a one of two plus the CFO, but this is not a two of three, because at no point in time can the two people from operation spend without the CFO, which would be the case in a two of three, right? Um, you can also do multi-sig of multi-sigs, so you can have a one of two and a one of two, meaning you have your operation teams uh, and your executive team, and you need one of each to sign a transaction for the transaction to go out. So this is not a two of four, because again, just the organization team cannot spend the money. You need one of each team. And then, of course, as we were say, uh, talking about the, the enforcement of policies, uh, having an HSM here, you can have a one of two, a two of three, or whatever, plus the HSM. The HSM is going to enforce the spending policies, and you cannot bypass the HSM. And I put a, a line under there uh, which says that most providers today, if not all providers today, um, that are providing this kind of services to have policies in your wallet, they are typically using a two of three with their HSM as one of the key. And that means that at any point in time, you have two keys. Your organization has two keys. So you could bypass the HSM policies. This can be, you know, a feature. Great. You, you don't need the HSM if the company doesn't sign or if they disappear. Cool. You can still spend. But also it's a bad thing because anyone, you know, if you're using any of these providers, anyone can just come to you, threaten you, and force you to empty the wallet. The policies are not going to be enforced because you have two keys. You can completely bypass the HSM. You can completely bypass the cosigner. And everybody knows that, you know. It's kind of a feature. So the reason why all of these companies are doing this today, all of these providers are doing this today, um, is for this. You know? What if the mandatory signer is lost? What if the HSM just fries? What if the company providing you with this policy enforcement 
close down. Maybe the regulator is going to tell them, no, you cannot sign any transactions anymore. We changed the rules, um, so no more signing. And then it was a mandatory signer, so your funds are lost forever. So that's why these organizations today are doing something like a two of three instead of putting DHSM in a mandatory signer. And so how can we improve that? Um, well, if you know me or if you know the work I've been, I've been doing uh, on Bitcoin in the past few years, time locks. So time locks, a lot of people are perceiving it as like, oh, a Bitcoin time lock is to lock my coins for a specific amount of time. No, it's just a tool in Bitcoin script that we can use for different things. It doesn't mean that your coins are locked necessarily. Sure, you can use a time lock for that. You could say, I'm going to lock my coins and I cannot spend them for one year. That works. But that's not what it's interesting for. It's interesting to actually trigger different spending policies over time. So you can have this, uh, this script we were talking about um, with like, you know, a mandatory signer where you can actually remove the signer over time uh, if the funds are lost, for example, are locked, for example. One example of time locks um, of the cool things we can do with them uh, that I presented here last year, actually, is decaying multisig. So you can now imagine a multisig that doesn't have a threshold, so a three of three, you have three people in your organization or two people in an HSM, and all three have to sign. This would be crazy if you didn't have the time locks, because that would mean that if any of the key is lost, you would basically lose your coins forever. But with the time locks, and again, that's things you can use today, right? There is no soft fork, no nothing. You can use that on Bitcoin today. With the time lock, you can say that if the funds are not moving for six months, so we assume they are blocked, you actually decay this to a two of three. So you're actually reducing the threshold over time. And if you really want to go crazy, you can reduce it to like one of three. Um, but yeah, I would not do one of three. That's a little bit too low in terms of security, but it's just for the example, right? You don't have to go all the way down. Something I prefer um, and we're implementing ourselves for our company is an expanding multisig. So difference here is that instead of reducing the threshold, we are increasing the number of keys. And again, that's doable today. Uh, you can like do that using Liana and other wallets. So it's really something you can use today for your organization. You have a three of three, but then maybe your organization has like a backup key that's in a safe at the bank or whatever, but this key is not valid right now. Your company, like your employees cannot go access this key and try to bypass you by doing a, a three of four. It's only a three of three, but if the funds are not moving for a specific amount of time, six months in this example, then the backup key at the bank would be able to unlock them with two other uh, signer. And you can keep increasing the number of keys. You can have trusted third parties, uh, you know, different people. So that's super interesting, and I really recommend you to look at this, because instead of reducing the threshold, you're not reducing the security that way. You're not reducing the number of signers. You're really increasing the number of people that can sign. So, it's a little bit better from a security perspective. Another thing you can do is that you can use completely different keys. So you can have Alice and Bob in a two of two, and if something happens, then it rotates to a completely different set of keys, a uh, different group of people, maybe in your organization, maybe trusted third parties, maybe two external companies that, you know, you don't have to trust uh, any single one of them. They might be both required to sign, but at least you know that your funds are not going to be lost forever. Something else you can do without removing the HSM. Uh, and I, I also think this is a very, very cool uh, scheme where like, we were talking about what if the HSM company or the, the HSM itself, the machine, fries or the company is forced by the regulator to close down and not sign any more transactions. You can actually not l remove the HSM key, but instead replace it by another one. And this is very cool because you don't have to remove the policy enforcement from your wallet. You can still keep the one of two plus, you know, company A, let's say Ledger, uh, with their uh, HSM product. And if one day Ledger cannot sign anymore for some reason, then after some amount of time where there is no transaction, it actually switch to another uh, well-known provider. And you can keep doing that over time. So you are never removing the, H the HSM rules there. You're just rotating them. So it's really cool against different type of attacks where you might be like, oh, if the regulator blocks the HSM company, then they know they can you know, uh, bypass the rules by forcing me to sign. In this case, no, they can't. It's just switching provider. And of course, the really, really cool thing is that you can mix and match all of those. So this is where it becomes really interesting and really important um, that Bitcoin script today, 
again, you know, this is all today. There is no soft fork here. Bitcoin script today lets you do very, very advanced stuff that's custom, that can fit any scale of organization. That could be your small coffee shop accepting Bitcoin. That could be your mining farm. That could be your ETF provider. I mean, any type of organization could benefit from this type of scheme instead of just using you know, two of three or three of five like most people are doing. So you can think of something like that. One of two plus the HSM enforcing the policy. If the HSM provider or the machine um, dies, then you switch to another provider. Then if the other provider is also shut down, because you never know, then you can actually put a multi-sig of your board of director to replace the HSM after more time. Uh, so you have a one of two plus a two of three, or whatever you want. And then you can Im even imagine that the one of two is actually lost, like both keys, for some reason. Um, and you still want a recovery option. And then you might go for a complete external recovery. That could be just your board of director if you wanted. That could be a set of um, key agents, so different third-party companies that you, know, you don't want to trust any single one of them. So you do uh, maybe a two of three out of them. And you pay them in advance, so they keep a key. But they are never able to sign unless all of your other options actually failed, right? All of the other time, locked, uh, time locks expire. And so this is like basically fixing the, the huge problem of insurance uh, in Bitcoin, which companies are really, really looking into. And that's also the reason why, again, companies are using custodians instead of doing the work and being in self-custody, because they are afraid of losing access to the coins. In this example, you can have self-custody that still kind of reverts to one of these external custodian or whatever you want to call them. And so, you know, if, if things go wrong in-house and you lose all of your keys, you can still then recover the funds from an insured company, a proper provider, a regulated custodian, whatever you, can, you want to call them. And so ultimately, you can actually assign the blame to them if they cannot recover your coins, because they should be able to recover them after the longest time locks. And so here you have basically the best of both worlds. You don't have to take the responsibility yourself of losing the coins. Of course, theft is outside of, uh, of the topic here, but same with the custodian, typically. So yeah, as long as, even if you lose all your keys, you can still recover your coins with one of these external recovery. And I think that's really the, the missing part that people have not really realized yet. You don't have to choose between self-custody and custodians all the time. You can kind of have both without the risk of the custodian rug pulling you because you are in self-custody as long as you don't fuck up. So yeah, that's basically my talk. Um, the company is Wizard Sardine. The tool you can use for all the things I presented today, uh, one of them, well, the one we developed is called Liana. If you want to talk to us about it, we have a booth at the very back of the uh, expo area. We would love to hear your use case and uh, yeah, talk to you about it. And another thing, yeah, everything I talked about here, open source, free to use, you know, the, the proper Bitcoin thing. Uh, you, you don't have to trust us or you don't have to trust anyone else. This is complete sovereign stuff. Um, we're doing Bitcoin the, the right way. So yeah, that's it for me. Thank you.